All right. Welcome, everybody. Welcome to uh, Beautiful GraphQL with Kathleen. I'm Guillaume Chevel. And I'm Darius Kutz. We work at Expedia Group, which is a leading travel platform, and that includes a number of companies besides Expedia, such as Verbo, Hotels.com, Orbis, Travelocity, and many more. Uh, we've been building GraphQL APIs in Kotlin for the last year and a half. And in the next 40 minutes, we're going to attempt to show you how easy it is to build a GraphQL uh, server in Kotlin uh, using some of the libraries that we open source as part of this effort. But before we get to the, the demo, let's take a step back and take a look at some of the technologies that we're going to be using today. So as the title implies, yes, we're going to be using Spring and Spring Boot. Uh, probably you heard about it. It's a little less, little less known frameworks, but um, Spring Boot is... Uh, aims to simplify or speed up your bootstrap your application development process, right? It's built on top of Spring it's, and some other libraries, and it provides you auto-configuration libraries that eliminate a lot of the boilerplate code by providing you some, well, predefined defaults, right? There are a number of auto-configuration libraries available for pretty much any technology out there. And Spring Boot also makes it very easy to create a custom uh, libraries if you need to as well. Today, we'll be building um, a web application. And since it's 2019, we will be using Spring WebFlex, which is a Spring reactive web framework, uh, which allows us to build a fully reactive, asynchronous, non-blocking web application. Today, we're also going to be using GraphQL, uh, which is a query language for your APIs. It is a specification that defines how to expose your data in some specific format that is not only easily discoverable by your clients, but also allows them to um, select only the data that they want. The data is exposed to a schema, which is a collection of documents that defines what sort of operations are available to the users and what sort of data they can query. GraphQL schema is also strongly typed which means that every single field in it has to be resolved to some either some primitive value, such as string or integer, some enum, a cl complex type, which contains a number of fields inside of it, or a list of those objects. Interestingly enough, GraphQL also makes a distinction between nullable and non-nullable types. So when you define your schema, you have to also dis define whether the field is nullable or not. And that constraint is enforced at the runtime. It is also important to note that the GraphQL itself does not tie uh, itself to uh, any specific database technology, nor some storage um, engine. Right? It's up to the developers to decide how, where they get the data from. So they can call, on, they can call some web services, the databases, some um, generated randomly on the, on the fly. And GraphQL is only tasked with exposing it in specific format to the client. When we're actually working with traditional REST-based APIs, right, we work with resources by the means of some URLs. Right? So we may have an endpoint for um, users. Right? We may have another one to fetch some product. Maybe we have another one to fetch some reviews data, which works great if you have a single client. Right? You can have a very optimized response to that single client. The problems arise when you have more than one client, which all have slightly different use cases. Some of them require a parts of the data, or they require some additional data. Maybe others require a combination of those different resources, right? GraphQL solves this problem by exposing a single endpoint, generally just slash GraphQL, that accepts a query uh, where clients explicitly specify the data that they want. This allows you to build a single API that's very flexible and custom tailored for each one of your clients. So for example, um, you may have a desktop app, right, and a mobile app, and they all both can request some common subset of data, right? But on the desktop, you have a, lot, a little bit more of screen real estate, right? So maybe you want to fetch some additional data to display that to the user as well, right? And uh, finally, well, we also got Kotlin, right? Kotlin is awesome. It is a great programming language, right? It has a number of awesome features that uh, makes it a pleasure to work with, right? But there are a number of GraphQL implementations out there, right? So why choose Kotlin to build your GraphQL APIs in it, right? The first and foremost, it is strongly typed and also has a null safety built into the language. You don't need any third-party libraries to get this information out. <laughs> this means that you can build your Kotlin data model that's going to match exactly how your GraphQL schema looks like. 
once you add in like the data classes, it allows you to eliminate a lot of the boilerplate code as well. But um, that's just a nice to have feature. At Expedia, uh, over the years we built a number of Java libraries, right? So for us, ability to just call those libraries and use them as they were, it was also a must. So your mileage may vary on that one. Um, and last but not least, well, core teams are also great, right? They allow you to write asynchronous code in an imperative way that it's not only easy to understand and reason about, but also makes your code more maintainable. So if we combine all of those together, well, we got GraphQL Kotlin. It is a set of libraries that aims to simplify how you build a GraphQL Kotlin server. Today, we're going to be using GraphQL Kotlin schema generator, which, as it's hard to guess, it's about generating a schema. When you're building a GraphQL server, there's actually a two ways of how you can approach it. You can either start with um, schema-first approach, where you manually craft out your schema and then map it to your code somewhere out there and hoping that they're going to match. Uh, that's the traditional approach. And alternative approach is, well, your code is a source of truth, and you generate your schema based out of it. With GraphQL Kotlin, we are following the code first approach, and we use reflections to automatically generate your schema directly from your source code. Your source code is your source of truth for all your business logic and the shape of the schema. This allows you to also write the code the same way as you were for traditional REST APIs, right? You write functions, they return some data classes, and it all just to get exposed to the schema. But um, schema is just a part of the, um, of the few things that you have to configure in order to have the GraphQL server. Well, besides schema, you also need a, a runtime to process those requests, right? You need to also have some additional um, some endpoint to accept the incoming request, HTTP request, and potentially you may want to do some like exception handling, et cetera, right? That's a lot of boilerplate code that you got to well, keep copying over and over again to every single application, right? That's why we also created GraphQL Kotlin Spring Server, which is a Spring Boot Auto Configuration Library that pre-configures all of those uh, beans for you. It's easily customizable. Um, and without further ado, why don't we check how it all works in practice? All right. Uh, we are developers here. So the first thing we want to see is code. All right. Uh, first question, is it readable at the, at the back of the room? Or do you want me to make a beer? Right? Awesome. So Spring, if you want to do a Spring Boot application, we have two ways, Maven or Gradle. Both uh, are some uh, tools here. I'm going to use Maven. If you're familiar with starter.spring.io, like the basic scaffolding you can have with Spring, in that case, Spring Boot uh, 2.2. And Kotlin, you would have in your POM file a parent, right? Nothing fancy here. Then you would have at the bottom the dependencies, uh, the plugin to for Spring Boot and for uh, Kotlin, that's pretty much it, right? The only thing we add on top to, to getting started is a single dependency here, our auto-configure library, as Darish mentioned, uh, GraphQL Kotlin Spring Server. And from a dependency perspective, that's all we need. That library will bring web flux, will bring a bunch of things like this uh, to make everything available. In terms of application and Spring Boot code, the only thing we need is this. We can't make anything simpler than this. With Spring Boot, we have all the defaults, all the, the auto configuration. Like that's just the bare minimum we can have to run some Spring application. And we just need one single um, configuration, which is just the list of packages. Why do we have that? Very simple. As we mentioned before, we are generating the schema from reflection. If you expose something like uh, the, I don't know, java.lang.local, you might not want to serialize all that together, right? You might want to expose that as a GraphQL class. So with this, we are just restricting, when we are building the schema, where, your, where the classes that are going to be exposed outside can come from. In here, it's going to be just that package. You can have a list if you want. There is no problem with that. And that's all you need to get started. Now let's write some code. So if I go here, and I say we have a conference query. Uh, we're going to have a class. It's a conference query. In the traditional REST world, you would do something like this. REST controller. 
right? And then you would have some get mappings, post mappings, and so on and so far. We are not going to do that today. All we are going to do is to say components. That's the classic like bin uh, declaration from Spring. And we need to have just one interface, which is query. So move this. Um, the reason why we need query is just for the schema generator, or for GraphQL Spring Server to tell the schema generator, these are all the queries you're going to work with to generate the schema. In GraphQL, you have queries, read, mutations, write, and subscription for streaming. And so we would have the same exact same interface, which is basically just a markup interface for mutation and subscription. We don't need anything else than this. Now we have that. We are going to start coding with a function. Let's say I want to expose some conference, which is basically a conference. It has a name. Let's say Kotlin Conf. Oops, sorry. And a year, which is 2019. Data modeling, as you can guess, and I'm pretty sure you're familiar with this. We can have name as a value here, as a string, and we can have then a value year, which today is going to be an int, and actually a nullable int, right? And here I have already, with that simple part of code, all I need to do to run my server, and we can just click run, right? So anything very fancy, we're going to pick up the conference class. As you can see here, we by default put the, um, or dump the, the schema in the console. So you can start see a type conference, but you know what? let's run some queries. We come up directly uh, in GraphQL Spring Server with something called the playground, which is basically a much better version of Swagger, right? So Swagger is kind of bulky. Here I can just say, I have a schema, so I have my documentation. Let me just refresh, reload this. Here I have my documentation. I can say, we can query for a conference, which has a type name. You will note here the exclamation mark at the end of the type. That means the field is not nullable. Year, if you remember, in Kotlin I put the nullability, which means that then we don't have the uh, nullable part, right? It's a bit uh, confusing at the beginning, having explicit nullability, non-explicit nullability, but after a while, you just get used to it. And so because I have, a, um, I have a schema, I can do something like this, which is simplistically uh, autocomplete. So I can have my conference, and then I have to specify all the fields I need to select. So in my conference, what can I have? I can have a name, I can have a year, and that's all I need. Like I type effectively all the fields, no wildcard, uh, which is super important because then we can be explicit and we can be uh, much more performant. When I run this, as you can see, I have, a, as you expect, a conference with the name, the year, and I know what I get because I have schema, and I get what I want because I select all the fields. Just think about a mobile app on a not so great uh, 3G connection somewhere, right? And if you're returning a bulky and super complex uh, JSON payload where it only needs a tiny bit of things, either you're going to <coughs> spread your services and duplicate your logic, or you're just going to pay the price of latency. With this, I have one API, and I create exactly as a client what I need. Not more, not less. So that is super interesting already. Once we have something like that, we can add a couple of stuff to our conference. First off, documentation. We all love documentation. We all hate documentation at the same time. So here, the same way you have with uh, OpenAPI, I can have a graphical description, which is um, just here, in that case, a simple uh, annotation or some places to learn things. And I'm just going to do this. As you can see here, I'm using a markdown, oops, I'm using a markdown syntax. That's because uh, Playground, in my case, can just interpolate all the, the description as markdown. So I can have like links, I can have something very rich, even I can do multi-line and so on and so forth. I'm not really limited there, and I encourage you to add a lot of documentation. 
The other thing we can do is on the year, I can say it's deprecated and not needed anymore. Restart the server. So we have added the capabilities to basically pick up the add deprecated from Kotlin and GraphQL all these reports, that kind of feature, which means if we look back here at our um, schema, we have the description in the schema that say by the spec feature of GraphQL. Same thing with the deprecation here, it's in the spec of GraphQL, which means that if I go back here, I just reload. We can have here in the documentation, if I just go down, look at the name, and yes, the name is just here are some place uh, to learn new things. You can see the nice markdown uh, interpolation. We can see that here we have already, just in the documentation itself again, the fact that a field is uh, deprecated. And finally, that's the cool stuff, because it's in the schema. If I reuse here, you would see, and that's something that even clients can do, obviously, if your client library is capable of doing it, you can have the deprecation information straight in the schema. In terms of resource management, it's just awesome. So this is actually a very powerful concept because since every client explicitly asks for every single field that they're interested in, you actually have an insight what fields they're actually using or not. They're also like on the client side, right? If they actually have the queries, it's quite often they may not be updating their queries, right? It's actually, I don't know if the schema change, but during the build tool, they actually they can configure their tools to actually fail this schema generation when they're actually referencing the deprecated fields as well. So there's a lot of powerful tooling around that as well. All right, so now we have a first class couple of fields, not very complex things here. Let's move on to a bit more data modeling. Nothing fancy, nothing too complex. Interfaces, Kotlin interfaces, right? We just have a name. We have two data classes. So we have attendees, all of you here, uh, attending a, a conference where we have a ticket type, ticket type being an enumeration of values. And we have speakers with names and a list of talks. So just like that, and it's very similar developer experience as you would have with most of the REST uh, frameworks. You can just have your, all, all your modeling like this and it would work exactly the same way. So if I go here, we just do something like this. I can return easily my list of people. I can have attendees, I can have speakers, and let's see how to query polymorphic types. Because that is something that is built in in the GraphQL specification, right? So if you are using GraphQL, Java, Go, Elixir, Kotlin, obviously, you would have support uh, uh, for polymorphic types. So here I go back, just reload so I have the latest schema. And I can say I have so, some people. The way to describe, so people is a list, remember? Here I describe the way I want, the fields I want for each and every element of the list. So because people, the only thing we know about people are names so far. So we have this. I run my query and I have Jane and Guillaume coming back. That's effectively what we expect, right? We, two people came back, no problem. First thing to notice is I still selected on, in my field my conference, and I'm selecting people. If you think about a RESTful application, and even more an H2S um, design, you will have a lot of calls to, exact, to achieve exactly the same thing. Here I had one HTTP request going down to my server and bringing me all the values. Again, performance-wise, it can have a huge impact especially when uh, things are complex. But people, we had attendees and we had speakers. So far, all I have is just a list of names. I have to be more explicit. I have to say like, all right, if the person, or the people in the case, uh, is an attendee, then, oh, now I have access to ticket because I'm strongly typed, I'm type safe. So I can have the ticket. At the same time, if I have a speaker, Guess what I can get? The list of talks. Here, we're just going to zoom out. And now I get all the fields. I'm strongly typed. If you have a strongly typed client uh, language, let's say TypeScript, you can generate classes from the schema and having all those kind of things 
plus null safety on top of it, it is just a pleasure to work with that kind of system to build APIs and to build contracts. Right, so that is pretty cool. Now if we go back to our code, we're just going to add one more feature here. We're going to say that we have a name start with, it's a string, and I want to have that as a nullable argument. Meaning that if I go here, I will have just it.name dot start with, uh, name start with, and doing something like this. So because I have a function, I can have arguments in Kotlin, which means that then when we reload our schema or our application, it's going to take a bit of a second. There we are, just reloading this. First off, let's look at our documentation, which is right here. We see that in GraphQL, you can have arguments, and in that case, nullable arguments, right? So if I have a nullable argument, it's exactly that case here. There is no argument for people. So I can just say this brings me back my two uh, attendees, my, my, my two people. And then if I want to say start name with, and I would say G here, just return, I just have Guillaume, that's effectively what we expect. And that is pretty awesome, right? We can specify, we can filter, you can do whatever you want with arguments. It's definitely a great power to have, right? Yeah, so when we're talking about polymorphic types, right? So interfaces are very useful when you have some common shared traits between the different objects, right? But sometimes you may want to return something that's completely disparate, right? They don't have anything in common, so maybe like some search results and maybe some error response, right? So the GraphQL also gives you an option to create uh, what they call union type, which is basically very similar to the interfaces, just you implement it as a marker interface without any uh, shared fields. That's about it. All right, let's move on a tiny bit. Now we've seen basically pretty much 90, 95% of schema design in GraphQL. So you're already experts in GraphQL just by knowing how to type some cutting code. That's pretty cool. Let's move on with something a bit more fun. Uh, so here we're going to create another class. Like we had data classes, conference people, and so on and so forth. We're just going to have something like this, which we could expose the same way right here. Uh, so if I do something like uh, this, right, I expose a schedule, whereas I have a greeting and my list of talks uh, coming, something like that. That's very easy, and frankly, it doesn't represent quite close what we would have uh, in the real world. So in the real world, what we might want to do is to fetch data from other sources, services, databases, caches, name it, it's up to you. So we are just going to, instead of returning directly something hard-coded, we are going to move a tiny bit, removing that from here. Then I will just go back there. And so we know how greeting and talk as two properties would work. I mean, same thing we had with uh, title and year before. But there is an interesting behavior to notice is this one. If I take my talks and I just move them to something like this. So just going to resolve uh, this, just the logger from SLF4J. I can have talks not only as a property, as a value, I can have talks as a f um, function. And just as I mentioned, here a simple like, we're gonna retrieve our talks from the uh, cache and from a database, which if we are thread blocking by default would look like this. So you would see a, something very quick. Obviously we are not going to implement the full call here, it's just as an example. A bit of log, returning a value, same thing there, like nothing really complex, right? Here we are just getting the list of our talks that are cached from the database, putting all them together, returning them. And we're gonna see how that works. And see that there is an interesting pattern between functions and values with graphical Kotlin. So I'm just going to move here the logs on the side and moving that here. So if I have, I'm just going to remove all this. Uh, I need to reload first, obviously. So we have here the schedule. We are going to say greetings. I mean, that's what we expect, right? We just returned the hard-coded value we had. No, no dark magic there. But if I start returning my list of talks, remember, we have a bunch of logs. We have a bunch of things. And we start to see logs appearing right there. 
Okay? So interesting behavior. When I have fields, everything is returned at the same time. When I have values, basically, it's basically Pojo serialization. However, when we have functions, and each field in theory are independent, the function will only be invoked when I'm selecting the field. Right? So if, as a, again, a mobile app on a very bad 3G connection, I'm just interesting uh, to the title, because I already have the list of talks like, uh, in memory, I can just do this. It's super fast. Right? If I want the list of all the talks, obviously I would go back here, and that will start to take time, and that's the way I can basically have a better um, performance gain just by changing a value to a function and to resolving that function because I have that gain in performance, and that's already a big thing, right? Why would I pay the price of, in my case here, two seconds of latency while I just need greeting, which is basically hard-coded? That doesn't make sense, and that could be basically have a huge impact. I just showed you, we are returning, or we are doing everything on thread.sleep, which means that we are blocking, and that, again, is not great. So we are just going to have a look at this. I'm going to, to do this. First thing here to note is I run, so I selected shell twice, talks twice, grading uh, twice, but only once in the response. So if I just put that back here, it's more readable. And that's because by default, if I select the same field multiple times, GraphQL will just say, no, no, we're not going to overly compute. We are basically going to stay where we are. And again, all the fields, all the functions are resolved independently from each other. So if I want to run the schedule twice, let's assume I have an argument that will filter different things. I, there is a technique called aliasing. So I just give here this one a, a pretty name. That's only client side. The server doesn't really care about this. And here I would have S1, S2. I run that. And it takes quite a lot of time, as you can, as you can see. But I have my two shadows at the same time. The reason why we are taking quite some time is if you look at our logs, let, let me just start over again so you can have a bit more view. It takes about, let's say, four seconds, a tiny bit more than four seconds. And effectively, we have one thread being used that basically prints in a serious way, um, in a serious way the first list of the logs, the second list of the logs, and yeah, if we look, it took basically four seconds between 33 to 37, right? The reason why is our programming model at this point is based on uh, threads. So we, the HTTP request comes down, takes a thread from the web server, and then we run all the computation on that thread. Even though, in theory, we should invoke all the functions asynchronously and in parallel, we cannot because we are bounded by one thread. And guess what's the uh, way to solve that problem? To have true parallelism, coroutines. So we are going to move a tiny bit of code. Now that's thread blocking, I don't like it. We are going to do thread non-blocking. And just moving here to delay. Uh, and obviously, suspending our functions. Right? So we can move to the coroutine world by doing something like this. Um, here, I want that function to be suspendable as well, to have its own uh, coroutine scope right there. Don't need this. And I want, in my case, but that's then up to you to manage your coroutines as you wish, I want to say, here I have an async. I have an async here, a tiny bit of this. I want to return that. And f last but not least, we have an await there and an await here. And just with that, I move completely my, um, my runtime, my server, to a non-blocking and async way. You need the return. I need the, oh yeah, yes. Keep forgetting that return. Keep forgetting that return. Um, that's why we are on stage. <laughs> so now we have our application. First thing before running queries, Suspendable functions, functions over um, properties. From a graphical standpoint, it doesn't matter. I managed to refactor 
from a performance perspective, my application quite a lot. Yet, my client, because I didn't change the schema, don't need to change anything whatsoever. My contract, my abstraction layer, aka the schema, is still the same. From a perf perspective, let's see how that looks like. So, you know what? We didn't do that during the practice, I know. We're just going to do three. And just to see if there is a difference. Four. Again, remember, we have two seconds, a bit more than two seconds per computation. So if I'm completely wrong, we're going to take about eight seconds to resolve this. Otherwise, it should be two. Let's try. One, two, and there. Time bit more than two. <laughs> so see, we have true performance in everything. We, thanks to coroutines, thanks to the programming model from GraphQL, we resolve everything in parallel. If we look at our logs, here we can see that we did a bunch of stuff completely in different orders, on completely different threads, I mean, three, three, two, one, and so on and so forth. That is truly a coroutine way to do things, an interactive way to do things. We are not bounded by one thread. All right. So here we are doing a bunch of cool stuff. Now there is a slightly more advanced feature in GraphQL, and effectively with GraphQL, Java, and Kotlin, called a request context. Sometimes uh, you want to have access, access to HTTP information, let's say a header, to get the language or to get a user token or something like this, and you want to have access to that information during the life cycle of your um, of your application when you resolve fields, right? For example, I would like to inter internationalize the greeting message based on the accept language header. To be honest, it's not that great to have the HTTP request or the HTTP response sometimes being accessed in the middle of the application when you're resolving a field like this. That's why we have request context. And furthermore, in GraphQL, you generally have to be very explicit in what you're asking, right? So the query is you specify all the parameters, but this is actually implied from the HTTP request that it's not part of the actual query that you're sending, right? All right, so here I have my uh, a new class, a new bin, effectively. Nothing really complicated. That's something that is, you remember the auto-configuration part brought from... Uh, GraphQL Kotlin Spring Server, that's why it works. Because then GraphQL Kotlin Spring Server, we should find a better name, <laughs> it's too long, um, is basically going to pick up a GraphQL context factory, and that factory can return any class you want. In here, I just expose the list of languages, nothing really complicated here. Uh, and I, how do I get that list of languages? Here, I have access to the HTTP request. The important part with that kind of thing is when I do something like this, I have four GraphQL subqueries that will be made for S1 to S4, but I have one HTTP request, which means that even in a case like this, I will have one request context being created for the whole lifecycle of the HTTP request, right? Not more, not less. So when I have something like this, then we can do some dark magic. I want to basically internationalize this, and we're just going to make some space. And we're going to do something like that. So you will notice a new magic parameter at GraphQL context, basically being the class I created before with just the language. And that's all I need. Because it's a at GraphQL context, there is that annotation, it's not going to be on the schema. That is just for you in your app, in your server, to do some things. And once I have this, then I can do whatever I want with this. I can have other arguments, which may or may not be in the schema. That's another thing, and so on and so forth. And GraphQL context is accessible from any place in your, when you're executing the GraphQL schema, so any function and as many level deep as you need. So you don't have to keep passing around from the top level down as you would normally do in some cases. Yeah. So I just here removed the greeting um, argument I passed from the beginning. Coming back here. Uh, up, 
thing I want to show you again is here there is no argument about GraphQL context. Uh, you will note that basically the logger is not there because it was private. The cached and the database fu functions are not there because they are private. If you want to not expose some uh, functions that have to be public for whatever reason, at GraphQL ignore would basically tell the schema generator just say ignore that uh, field or ignore that function. No problem with that whatsoever. And so when we have something like this back, here I already have, actually not this one, that's another kind of info, don't care. Uh, so let's see how that works. Default behavior, about in a second, here I have my greeting in English. And if I move back to uh, here my HTTP header, so accept uh, language, and I say, oh, I'm going to accept French today. Rerun this, and bienvenue is now my greeting. So I have my request context used the same time everywhere. No problem with that. I can have access to meta information, again, languages uh, or user tokens or whatever. All right. Yeah. So hopefully by now you can see how easy it is to build the GraphQL Kotlin um, server. Right? It's, um, I'll, we just require a single dependency, right? Configure a single one, single line of the uh, properties, right? And then you just implement your code as it is, right? Um, we do have a lot of other examples and as well, pretty fairly extensive documentation available on our GitHub repo. And, um, well, follow us on Twitter for our GraphQL journey. And, uh, well, thanks, everyone. <laughs>